Hello, folks, and welcome to the latest in the No Fluff Just Stuff virtual webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about design patterns. Of course, my name is Michael Carducci. I'm going to be your host, and we are joined virtually, of course, by Mr. Daniel Hinojosa. And howdy. I am, oh, howdy. And I am very <laughs> excited to dive into this topic because design patterns have been sort of hotly contested. They've been they've been debated quite a bit. I mean, there's there's I remember getting my copy of the, the, the design patterns book. And, and I know certainly this is one thing that I've been guilty of. I don't know if anybody else has done this as well, but when I got my copy of design patterns and I started learning some of these things, uh, the very next, very next opportunity that I have, I mean, the instant that I started writing any more code, I found a way to work in virtually every single pattern into what I'm, I was yeah. doing. And I'm sure that wasn't the intent, but you know, that was, I'm afraid to say decades ago. And I'm, I'm really glad we're having this conversation because one of the things I came to realize through that process of, 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 of over applying design patterns was that design patterns were created to solve problems. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are problems with, the, the technology we're using. They're maybe addressing deficiencies in the language. Other times they are just dealing with certain challenges that, that are in the current software development zeitgeist, which maybe go away. Paradigms shift. And so, mm -hmm. Daniel, I am so grateful to have your expertise to, yeah. to, to kind of un, unravel this, uh, the state of design patterns. So Daniel, uh, Give us a quick introduction, if you don't mind, and we'll dive in. All right. Sounds good. I may, uh, I may do a little uh, share screen here, uh, but uh, you're absolutely right. And, uh, and by the way, Michael, just feel free to uh, uh, chime in on any of that because it sounds like uh, you do have uh, an excellent idea on uh, these design patterns. And, and like you said, uh, Michael, the, uh, there was uh, a, a little bit of a contention within Twitter I can't find the tweet anymore. Uh, I think it, it had been scrubbed. Uh, I think Twitter's just made for regret. <laughs> where, where uh, yeah, I think someone had tweeted. Yeah, let's see, hold on here. It looks like my screen share is being paused. Here, let me try that again. Yeah, so uh, yeah, someone had, uh, had tweeted. Can you see my uh, screen there, Michael, on design patterns? On my end, it says my screen share is... Uh, you're gone now. It was showing up. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just black. So uh, yeah. you might you might need to do like a whole screen instead oh, of like it's an back app. now. I'll just I'll just do it this way. Yeah. All right. So yeah, design pattern. So uh, tweet came out saying, ah, you know, what's up with this book? It's from 1994. <laughs> uh, who uses this anymore? Uh, but um, I was, you know, people disagree or agree on uh, on things on Twitter all the time and. Uh, and so forth, the design patterns. It's one of my favorite books, just like you said, Michael, this has a, a lot of patterns, but to what Michael said as well is that all these patterns are testable, except for probably uh, Singleton. Singleton is, uh, is kind of tough to test, uh, and that's well known anyway. And I think people have kind of like a more of a visceral reaction to, to Singletons. Mm -hmm. uh, I use Singletons in Scala, so I do a lot of Scala programming language, uh, but as part of it, it's like a part of the language. We don't have anything uh, called statics. And what we're actually doing is we're actually using a singleton. Uh, but the thing is, this is our language, right? This is how we communicate to one another. So if I tell Michael, hey, Michael, let's do, uh, let's do an adapter pattern on this. Uh, Michael may know what that means. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, he does know what that means. So uh, <laughs> we know what, uh, what a design pattern is. And I really like this quote. This is uh, one of them that I had picked up uh, in the past. Each pattern describes a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment and describes a core solution to that problem in such a way that you could use this solution a million times over without ever doing it, uh, doing it uh, the same way twice, which I, you know, uh, I totally agree with. Uh, this Christopher Alexander is not a software engineer, though. Uh, I forgot what it is. Uh, I think it's for uh, architecture, for buildings. Uh, but 
you know, we, we learn our lessons and, and uh, that's what a design pattern is. It's a, it's a book of lessons from hardened developers that, you know, over and over again have learned, hey, these patterns solve a particular problem. And it was very, very well thought out. Uh, and so, you know, just in my opinion, then these design patterns uh, aren't uh, going away. So what's, uh, Michael, what's your, uh, what's your favorite uh, design patterns that, that you know and love? You know them by heart, know them by name? You have uh, yeah, I, I would say my favorite, or, or at least one that I, I, I tend to use a lot these days is the strategy pattern. Strategy pattern is a very good one, yeah. Yeah, just plug in, in right? Plug in yeah. a, a certain strategy. Uh, of what, oh, we have chat here. Oh, cool. I like, uh, I like chatting with. All right, so someone said already, oh, I love chat. <laughs> Everyone, everyone has an opinion on something. All right, everybody. Uh, someone put in uh, your favorite design pattern. Only one. Just uh, choose one. Which one's your favorite? And so, and, and we've uh, got a few. Uh, Singleton is evil. Um, Singleton I, is evil. I very very rarely use the the Singleton pattern, but but I I, yeah. I find uh, occasional uses for it. Uh, I yeah. like this. A design pattern is a solution to a problem in a context. And every one of them has consequences. Yes, I love that. I love yeah, that. Yeah, that is good. Strategy um, all the way. Paisley. <laughs> so if you use a design pattern, but you don't actually Dave, have a problem. Paisley's not a pattern, man. <laughs> Tartan. <laughs> With the last name Donald, excellent. Yeah, Tartan. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> I should have been clear. <laughs> What's your favorite design? I guess it is a design pattern, right? Tartan is a design pattern. <laughs> Yeah, Excellent. I, I, I have, uh, you know, I, I have a, I, I don't know what you would call this pattern, but, uh, but I'm trying to coordinate yeah. with my mask. That's, that's, that's a very nice one. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, let me go to this. Uh, now I'll just, uh, I'll just leave it as is. Uh, this is a particularly good article uh, for anyone who's interested because he talks about uh, movies and sagas and anything from uh, you know Star Wars and has the uh, hero odyssey like that is that is a pattern that movies use every every occupation has that particular pattern uh, for whatever it is that they do and software is no different so it's an excellent article love for all of you to uh, pick that up in defense of design patterns uh, what I liked about the original book uh, were these uh, diagrams which I never fully understood <laughs> Now they use UML. I'm actually thankful for UML. UML has also gotten uh, a little bit of controversy in there. Do we really use uh, UML? And yeah, I guess maybe we don't design software with UML. We don't use rational rows. I think some people have some uh, unfond memories of designing in rational rows as well. But um, no, these, uh, these patterns were great. I, I love UML. Um, I, again, I don't fully deal in UML uh, throughout my work days and work hours, but uh, they serve a purpose. And again, it's, it's almost a linguistic, right? And it's how we communicate with one another. I like the original book because it had, you know, diagrams like these. I thought that was re really cool. Uh, but uh, for the design patterns, the original design patterns book was written for C++, but then it just took off from there. Head first design patterns, C sharp design patterns. Uh, a lot of these are really well written. I think also probably even a little bit better than the uh, original Gang of Four book, but everybody had a different take on these particular uh, uh, particular uh, design patterns. Uh, and in Jeff fact, has, uh, you, yeah, oh, go so ahead. I, I don't mean to yeah. interrupt, but but no, uh, you you interrupt all you want. Right on the top of your list here is JavaScript design patterns. And if I have seen more flux in what should and should not be a design pattern anywhere over the last 30 years, it's JavaScript. Because, because we've been, we, we came up with a bunch of JavaScript design patterns to deal with the fact that Java's, JavaScript is not very, very structured. And then we added a lot of structure to the language. So with, with ECMA 6, um, and, and as we've, as, as we've really matured that, 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 that language in that space, a lot of these patterns don't even apply anymore. Yeah. Best JavaScript design pattern. Don't use JavaScript. <laughs> um, oh, <no. laughs> but I mean, that's a perfect put, example. That one, Jonathan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and that's a perfect example though, of, of how these things change and how quickly they can change because the way that Absolutely. I wrote JavaScript five years ago is not how I write it today at all. Nope. Definitely not. Right. Yeah. Um, and we all, we all mature the same way I'm writing Java now is not the same way that I wrote Java even like five years ago or 10 years ago. 
all that's changed. And all that's changed the way what we call or how we call design patterns today. They're not the same thing just because we do. And a uh, and nice segue here, because we're programming more immutable now. Uh, we're programming with functions now. And that changes a lot of things on how we, how we do these design patterns. So a lot of these design patterns kind of, not want to say evaporated, but it has been interpreted in, much a, uh, in a very simple way that it just becomes uh, a new term called functional programming. All Raju right. is in the house. He's saying, "No, uh, not Raju. Oh, he's going to give me a hard time." No, just kidding. <laughs> well, all right, uh, web so, assembly. Yep. Yeah, go well, ahead. So, so specifically, he said that uh, I'm trying to find it. <laughs> I disagree. ES6 plus outside of the, outside of patterns around VAR and IEFE still exist as is. I don't know. I was thinking of things like the module pattern, uh, and and some of the. I'm, tr I'm trying to think of the names of these things. I think it was, but there were certain ways that we would we would kind of write and structure our JavaScript. And, and now that we have classes and, and things like that, I, I think we approach some of that differently. But, uh, and Jonathan, yes, I am going, I'm with you, Wasm for the win. I don't think it's gonna kill JavaScript, but I think we're going to do a lot less with it. That's gonna be, um, yeah, the module pattern has been removed. So that was, that was my specific example. Uh, of, of JavaScript. Thank you. I'm glad I, I'm glad I was, that's the right term. <laughs> Yeah, so let's. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on uh, builder pattern because this one has gone through some contention as well. Is is the builder is the builder pattern, yeah, even applicable now? So here's the UML on the uh, left hand side. I think we've all seen the uh, the builder pattern. Uh, so uh, as an example, espresso drink builder. Uh, the way I can actually call this uh, with some code here. Let's take a look over here. Uh, design patterns. Let's, uh, let's do up a uh, builder pattern. Yeah, here's one right over here. Do you use this one, Michael? Or, or uh, you do uh, C-sharp. So is this, is this one available a lot in C-sharp and what you do? Yeah, and in fact, a lot of, um, a lot of, I, I, I'm choosing my words carefully because, sure. uh, but uh, like extension methods allow you to do this really easily and, and, and you see this from time to time. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah. So this one, like flower builder. And uh, from this, what uh, usually you get from like, if you have a static method called builder, you get some sort of object uh, from that where you can just uh, chain things together lazily, and then finally call uh, the build. So uh, yeah, builder pattern has uh, gone through a little bit of contention, particularly from uh, James Ward. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's gone against uh, the builder pattern. I don't <laughs> uh, very smart developer. So uh, uh, every builder should be a constructor build. So he's in favor of using languages with uh, default, um, default, what was it? Uh, default parameters uh, on the constructor uh, instead. I'm not sure I agree with him, but uh, he certainly has gone against what, uh, what the builder pattern is. He's against mutability as well. So he prefers immutability and making illegal states unrepresentable. Uh, illegal state meaning like if you need a list and it has to be a non-empty list, then you should have a type called non-empty list and, and not deal with uh, anything that is empty and all these illegal states uh, should be avoided. Uh, he's more like myself, more of a scholar programmer, so, but he has, uh, he has a different take on the builder pattern. I left a link here for, uh, for a podcast that he has uh, against the builder pattern. But here's the thing about the builder pattern, uh, which uh, I find a, a little bit uh, interesting. Uh, here, let me bring up a uh, J shell over here. Uh, uh, we use Bill. Yeah, no. Oh, wait. yo, go you, please. You are, you are only sharing Keynote, so you might want to replace that with a full screen share instead of there an app share. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, so let's use uh, let's use uh, J shell, and uh, and uh, talk about the builder pattern. So I was discussing the builder pattern uh, with uh, with James Ward. And I, I'm going to argue that this is the uh, builder pattern. I see Dave Klein here, so he's going to like what I'm going to say next. But if I do stream of, which I think all of you know, uh, if I do something like stream of, I get this weird junk, right? Uh, this uh, reference pipeline dollar sign head 506C589E, right? And we all, we all know that. And most of the time, we just accept it as um, you know, some kind of strange object. But when we do the builder pattern, if you've ever done the builder pattern, you usually start off with some sort of method and then it returns uh, the builder itself. And then you just continually add on this. 
Stream is the builder pattern, well, whether you had seen it or not. Uh, that is the builder pattern because after this, you know, I could do, you know, a map on this or, you know, whatever uh, from it. And then instead of dot build at the end, what do we do? We usually do a collect or some kind of uh, terminal operation uh, from this, like, uh, I think, what's it called? Collectors to list. Mm -hmm. And then it just, it just brings up that number. And it seems that everything uh, functional, uh, Dave Klein, I don't know. Do you, uh, do you do any Kafka there, Dave Klein? I'm just kidding. That's, that, was a, that was a softball question over to, uh, uh, to Dave there. Uh, but here's an example of Kafka Stream. So if you're going to be doing any kind of uh, data engineering, uh, here's an example from Kafka Streams. Hello, builder, right? Builder pattern all over again. So you see builder patterns all the time. It's, it's good to recognize this. It may not be the classic way that we do a builder pattern, but it's still the builder pattern and we see it um, you know, in different ways. Another one is, uh, Larry, let's try this one here. Uh, another design pattern or a builder design pattern uh, that we may see is uh, reactive programming. So let me bring up a little sample over here. This too is a builder pattern, or at least in my book it is, to where I have observable create. Uh, but the things that we're building, it's, again, it's not necessarily we're returning an object, but what we have in this case is a function. So functions change, changes, uh, I guess, the dialect, but not the language. Uh, so the builder pattern is the language, but this is just a different dialect in, in how we describe what a builder pattern is. So this one is using an observable or flux or whatever kind of reactive programming uh, library you wish to use or rx, uh, rx.net if you're on C sharp, uh, that this one is an observable create where you get an emitter and then you choose what it is that you wish to create or what, what you wish to build out of it. Yeah, so that's my take on builder pattern. <laughs> Well, you know, speaking of builder patterns, so you were asking me if I use that. I, I do from time to time. I tend to approach that from uh, uh, if I'm if I'm it, not a lot of libraries in the .NET land uh, implement that, but I do that from time to time. It's easy to do with um, with its extension methods, which is just mm -hmm. kind of a cool little language technique. But I realize somewhere that we use that all the time mm -hmm. is link. Uh, L I N Q. Uh, yep. Link is all builder pattern too, or at least in my book, my strong opinion. Absolutely. And there, there are different dialects of link, but I tend to use the older one. So like collection dot where dot select dot filter dot map, whatever. Right. And you chain these, these long things up and we use this all the time. And, and so link is interesting to me because I believe link kind of backdoor injected a lot of functional programming paradigms into the otherwise OO desert that is C sharp. And, yeah. and that's what I'm really interested in that functional is working its way in, into all these other paradigms. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I mean, even years ago, I think it was either Craig Walls or Matt Stein, I forget who on the mm -hmm. no fluff tour was had a talk called functional solid about kind of getting the best out of, out of these two worlds and, and how mm -hmm. they complement each other. So with, the, with, with functional programming coming, and Java, Jeff just says uh, Java streams are functional as well. Mm -hmm. So how is functional programming changing the way we think about? Um, well, I'll have an example for you. Uh, okay, I don't, I don't want to yep. derail. So, so no, no, it's fine. You're not derailing. You're, you're doing great. And there's one other oh, thing here. in the, in the yeah, chat that somebody mentioned. I just want to throw it out there. Sure, yeah. Uh, he says, uh, this is Adon, Adon F. Um, just Adi. Just Adi. 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 Yeah. ADI. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank you. About design patterns, I think the caution is that it should not be seen as a replacement to the art of software design. Software design is highly challenging in a creative and a highly challenging creative process that must strive to create the best, in quotes, model for a complex problem. Best, of course, mm -hmm. being, being subjective, but, um, but I, and, I, and, I, and I agree with that as well, uh, that, that, it, that, that these can be a, a proxy for strategy almost. But mm -hmm. um, anyway, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Just to add yeah. a little to that, I think that's the, that's the thing we complain about, like whether it's Daniel or you, when we look at a piece of code, we see all these design patterns thrown at a system, at a body of code, 
but there is no coherent design. Mm-hmm. You know, design patterns oh, do not give you design. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And overall architecture design. Yep. Go ahead. Planning. Yep. Go ahead. Exactly. Uh, and I agree with that. I, and I'm 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 a hands-on software architect these days, and um, and, and and this is this 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 is this is the, the bane of my, my existence that we're trying to bring these two things together. Um, so the, the big, the coherent big picture, but also the, the, the details that they are, they're all working in concert towards the whole. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a, here's one adapter pattern, uh, which I can't live without. So one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, I would like to promote is uh, test driven development uh, and, you know, ensuring that you're creating some really good outstanding code based on tests, it's test first, and uh, you get a pretty good product out of it. But one of the complaints I get is, uh, well, it doesn't adapt to change very well. Like I've, I've created this code, but now I need to make a change and that's going to break all the tests. Uh, where my argument against that is uh, adapter pattern. We have, these, we have these wonderful design patterns that allows us to make a change without changing any kind of interfaces. Okay, so here's an example here. I have a Celsius thermometer, for example, uh, but I need it in Fahrenheit because uh, I'm American and inefficient when it comes to reading temperature. Uh, actually, one uh, someone stated that Celsius is good for uh, like a zero through hundred kind of range, but Fahrenheit is great for just human comfort. Fahrenheit is the human comfort. Uh, uh, temperature. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, what is it in Fahrenheit zero? That sounds pretty cold. Uh, you know, what is it? Uh, what is it in Fahrenheit right now? It's 100. That sounds pretty hot. Like that's our comfort level. Uh, but Celsius is more of the scientific level, but it means very little to us uh, as far as our comfort levels. I'm sure Europeans have their have already made the transition in their head as to what a comfortable Celsius is versus an uncomfortable Celsius. Uh, but that's an adapter. Am I going to change the test? Am I going to change the core of Celsius thermometer? No, I'm just going to, you know, wrap that up and, uh, and just create something else out of it. So I don't need to ruin the interface of anything on the adapter pattern. But where an adapter pattern really, really shines as well. Uh, so my, one of my favorite languages is, is Scala. And uh, so an adapter would be something like this. Let's say I want to call uh, 230 is odd from this. And in Java and in Scala, there's no uh, is odd. And this is kind of what uh, Michael Carducci was alluding to, that I can create a uh, int adapter or wrapper, or whatever you want to call it, wrap it around an int, and then just create these methods, right? So I could do something like uh, is odd, uh, def is odd, that I'll take the uh, mod of two and ask it if it's not equal to zero, and I'll do the is even, and I'll just return whether it is the opposite of is odd. So there's my wrapper, right? So I could, I could essentially uh, say uh, new int wrapper, or uh, adapter, sorry, <laughs> uh, in here, and then just call IU, and just ask uh, the question then, is this odd? But let me come back over here and let me do it again. And I'm gonna put a term implicit on here and that's it. Uh, and this is the way we do it in Scala. Now all we have to do is just do this. And so I actually use the adapter pattern a lot. And so this is called an implicit class uh, in Scala, but I recognize this easily as the adapter pattern. So how we do it is, is changing as well. As uh, C Sharp and uh, Kotlin, I think, do it a little bit differently as far as the extension methods go. Oh, interesting. 100F. So Jeff has some, like, uh, some history in here. Yeah. 100F was originally supposed to be the human body temperature. So excellent. And, and yeah, and, and zero was supposed to be the coldest that anything could possibly get, which was... <laughs> You know, looking looking backwards, that was uh, uh-huh. it, it, it's, it's amusing uh, that 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 we thought that that's like the coldest anything could ever ever get. Um, I, I threw into the chat just kind of a comparison: okay. zero Fahrenheit is cold, a hundred Fahrenheit is hot. Zero yes. Celsius is cold, a hundred Fahrenheit, a hundred Celsius is dead. Zero Kelvin <laughs> is dead, a hundred Kelvin is dead. Um, right. I I saw somebody put that out there once and. Uh, 
<laughs> and I'm, I'm like, yep. Yep. Anyway, I don't mean to go, please continue. No, it's all right. It's all right. Uh, observer, uh, observer pattern. How about, or anybody here still uh, use the observable or observer pattern still? Uh, so in other words, a change happens in one object. Uh, we oh, see we that use reflect it. elsewhere. Uh, I mean, all the time, right? That was, that was my other thought was I realized that, that I use the observer pattern all the time without even thinking about it because I still do a lot of uh, web development and, and mm -hmm. all of the, um, all, all, all of the major web frameworks are, are handling that for us. Mm -hmm. A change happens over here and, uh, yeah, web sockets, right? Anybody who does any kind of even uh, like JavaScript on the uh, front page is, is doing some kind of observer pattern. You're just you're just getting some kind of callback from it and reacting to it. So, uh, yeah, observer pattern. But I think also we've we've taken a a different kind of uh, tact to it. That we don't usually have to listen to like in this case here. We don't have to add our own observers. Usually, some sort of framework, maybe the browser, somebody else is is hand or some other API is handling who's observing what. You just subscribe to it. Uh, maybe an event bus. Um, so that's kind of. That's kind of changed as well. It's not the same classical pattern that we have, but also reactive programming as well, whether you're dealing with RxJS, since Raju, you told me Raju is here. Anybody who does any kind of Rx or Rx.net or uh, Spring Reactive, uh, you're using the observer pattern and the iterator pattern. The more and more elements come in, you've created some uh, functional programming to handle uh, what's going to happen when a certain event happens and then dump it somewhere else. All we're doing is just we're setting up the pipelines uh, whenever we uh, use the observer pattern. So I think that's the way that uh, that has changed. If anybody has any uh, uh, input on how they're using the observer pattern nowadays, I don't think it's quite the classic way, but uh, we certainly use it, but a little bit differently nowadays. Let's see. <laughs> Everyone's still talking about temperature. <laughs> All right. Excellent. So decorator pattern is one of my favorites. And I don't think oh, we can live without yeah. it. And, and I don't think we're going, we're going to uh, change on this one. So I love the decorator pattern. That should have been on top of my list. Oh, that would have been, yeah, decorator pattern. That's another one uh, so, that we yeah, don't go ahead. think about. Oh, no, I was just saying that's another yeah. one that we don't think about. That's true. But sometimes, yeah, sometimes it comes out and sometimes it ends up being, uh, ends up being the hero of the day or the heroine of the day. Uh, and that's the uh, decorator pattern. So kind of like the adapter pattern, this is a, a good way to uh, affect any kind of change. So in other words, uh, one of the things that I try to help developers avoid is getting scared when someone comes by and says, you, Michael, make a change to this code. And you're like, oh, <laughs> and you make a change to the code. You break the test. Uh, all the uh, interfaces in the API have cascading failures throughout. And now uh, you can't compile your code. And now it's a big mess just because you initially got scared at that reaction of like you, you changed the code. Uh, but that's where the adapter pattern really comes in very nicely. That's where the uh, decorator pattern also comes in very nicely because we could affect uh, some sort of change uh, without ruining our code, without ruining our tests, okay? Uh, like a simple fun one is usually something like this. Uh, let's make a Sunday, right? And uh, have a decorator on it. And I could have uh, a nuts decorator, a uh, fudge decorator, whipped cream, vanilla ice cream, and I could just decorate my fudge sundae by essentially just wrapping and wrapping and wrapping and, and creating something uh, decorative off of that, of that particular base, right? And that's, that's a, a simple example on, on how we know uh, the decorator pattern. But a real good use case, here, let's take a look at the chat. Someone's going to say something about ice cream. Oh no, there's, I thought someone was, I, I like Sundays. <laughs> All right. We're still talking about temperature. I know. <laughs> People love talking about the weather and temperature. Yep. Uh, so is here's hydration a, a decorator then. Is hydration a decorator? What do you mean by that? Like that was from Jonathan, okay. Jonathan H. Um, and I don't know if, if, uh, that's weather or like you're talking about hydrating an object. Yeah, I don't know. Add, add a little bit more to that and we'll answer that. Or is it hydrating just drinking an water? Hydrating an object. I don't know. 
like hydrating an object. So I deal a lot with immutability. So before you create an object, it should already be hydrated. That's the way kind of I've been developing and not uh, continually adding there. To me, that's more of a creational pattern. Uh, maybe back again to the builder pattern for uh, hydrating a particular object. But I think we're, we're all going to have different takes on it. But uh, here, let's take a look at this. Uh, this one is from uh, definitely buy this book if you haven't. This is uh, Michael Feather's uh, book on uh, refactoring uh, legacy systems. And uh, I stole a chapter from this. I talk about this in my uh, testing the undesirable. As testing the undesirable is I need to get some TDD wrapped around this. And, uh, but it wasn't designed with uh, TDD. It wasn't designed for any testing in mind, but I need to catch up to some of this testing. So one of the strategies that's presented in the book is rat class. So let's say someone comes to, let's say, Michael, I'll pick on you again. Someone comes to Michael and says, yo, <laughs> uh, make a change here. Uh, we have a deposit in here. Or let's say Dave Klein. Dave Klein's more likely to do this. Uh, you. So Dave Klein goes to Michael Carducci. You, I need, I need to audit this deposit. Uh, let's say this is a bank or something like that. I need to audit this deposit because what I want to do is I want to take and audit the information of all the deposits and put that into Kafka. Okay, so how do we go about doing that? That, that wasn't designed uh, in mind. And the thing is that everybody else wants this public void uh, deposit uh, to, uh, to exist because every API call is dependent on it. So how do we go about this? So to everybody in the outside world, they're depending on the signature, public void deposit int amount. So how do we get around it? So the... The thing I really like about Michael Feathers' book is that, um, is that he kind of does things the way that uh, civil engineers or construction crews fix bridges or freeways, right? Uh, they usually route traffic uh, and then they fix a segment of the bridge and then they move that over. And then, you know, traffic doesn't stop. Uh, sometimes it does, but most of the time they just keep traffic moving, but, you know, they just route things differently. That's what this book does. What's it says, the, okay. What's the book? Go ahead. What's the title of the book? Uh, if you want to help me look for the title, it's Michael Feathers. Is it working uh, just look for Michael with, Feathers Legacy. I forgot what the full title is exactly. Uh, so Jonathan D says, working effectively with legacy code. Legacy code. Yep. Thank you okay. very much. It is yep. linked in the chat. Yeah. Thank you very much. I should have put that picture here. But uh, he has one called a wrap class. So this deposit is the thing that I want to uh, create some audits for. So uh, one of the techniques is called extract an interface. So from this class, we're extracting an interface out of it. Uh, maybe this class will be called uh, foo impl or foo standard or, or something like that. But now I have an interface uh, called deposit uh, that everyone can uh, access and use. And then what I could do is I could create a class from this that implements that interface. Uh, so let's say foo logger that I have a deposit here where I can program this auditing. So let's say this protected void audit is going to send information to Kafka, okay? Uh, because our new boss, Dave Klein, really likes Kafka and wants, wants some auditing for every kind of deposit that is happening. So we could do this with TDD, make sure that we do uh, the audit for this. And so our foo logger then can wrap around, you know, the, uh, another foo object since we have an interface, but we have essentially decorated it. That's what it is that we're doing. And so take a look right over here uh, uh, where we have this audit for depositing and audit for deposited. Now we're, uh, uh, you know, we're doing this kind of event sourcing, sending messages when certain events happen over to Kafka. And then now we have our deposit in here. And that's just using a design pattern. So decorator really comes in. And if I map the UML from doing this kind of technique, uh, you should recognize this UML as the decorator pattern. So decorator pattern is great. This one I learned from Venkat, and uh, then we'll, uh, let's open the floor again. Uh, this one I learned from Venkat, and uh, very awesome. Functions at, ooh, well, <laughs> my, my voice took a detour there, but functions as a decorator as well. So let's say here we have a camera uh, that has a certain color to it. But as the decorator, what I'd like to do is I'd like to decorate it uh, with uh, some functions. 
So this color for this camera, I want to go darker and darker or lighter and lighter. And all these are decorations for the color. Now, Venkat's strategy for this is um, just use functions, use a reduce. And what, one of the things that you could do is you could take all these decorators and do a function compose, essentially just chain everything together. And then you have uh, the decorator on top of it. So again, functions are going to change the way in which we do a lot of these design patterns. And we're going to do it uh, very easily that way. All right. Let's uh, take a look at uh, Michael. Any statements? Uh, well, one of the things I really want to uh, address, there's a question really early on, because because going through this, we're talking about we're talking about patterns that that are still valuable, that that still have their place that we're using, uh, some of which are so ubiquitous that it's like David Foster Wallace is this is water that we don't even notice them because they're 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 around us all the time, but mm -hmm. what about the patterns that are not very practical. Uh, a question came up in the chat, and the question was, why is the singleton pattern evil? Um, Everybody has their own reason for dislike, I think. But I mean, yeah, go ahead. Generally, it's not something that I, I leap to. It's something, it, it, it's very rare. It's like, I have this very, very niche problem to solve, and, and I'm going to use it, but when I talk about it, I kind of get I kind of get dirty looks from from people at conferences that are just like, "Ooh, the singleton." <laughs> so I guess what I, I, I guess what I, I'd like you to articulate is is what are some of the patterns that are that are falling out of favor and why? I think uh, some of yeah. So that's a good question. I don't even have a slide deck on this one. Uh, probably visitor pattern because it's it's kind of weird, clunky in the way that it works, and and there are probably better ways and better designs around it now uh, instead of the the and I'm talking about the classic visitor pattern. Uh, there have been re some rethinking and redesigning uh, for the visitor pattern. Uh, singletons to some extent, although like, in, uh, like I said, in Scala, we have singletons, but we use it uh, purely for factory patterns, which is something that we use a lot. And I think Java programmers use a lot and every, everybody uses a lot. So factory patterns aren't growing uh, anywhere, but I think singleton is going to be uh, one of the others. Now, the original uh, blogger who talked about uh, not the uh, not the what was it the memento pattern? I think it was it was uh, what it was called. Some of these are not out of favor. It's just that they've essentially already been uh, implemented. So uh, let's see. Yeah, visitor pattern um, and memento or, or flyweight. Flyweight's the one. So flyweight, um, you may want to design yourself. An example of the flyweight pattern is string in Java. Uh, so strings have a uh, string pool. So every time you say, you know, var e is equal to string, if that string already exists in memory, you're just using a copy of that string. Uh, and, and so that is the flyweight pattern. You're just caching objects for others to use. Uh, and if they're immutable, they're just going to be thread safe and, and safe all around. So there are some that people think, oh, why do I need this one? but they're actually good ideas. So it actually works both ways, but I would, I would choose probably singleton probably has, doesn't have that as much favorability and visitor pattern probably wouldn't have that much favorability nowadays. And Raju asks, are there any patterns that are specific to functional programming that don't find origins in OOP? Yes. And uh, I think uh, Raju even answered it as well, uh, which are, is the M word. He brought up the M word uh, and uh, those are- called, Oh, that was Bruce. Um, Oh, oh, what? Oh, that was Bruce. Yeah. Monads. By, by the way, so hi, there Bruce. It is. I, I Bruce. apologize to the people that I haven't been like, hey, because uh, like Dave, Raju, Alex, yeah. Bruce, uh, there are so many uh, kind of familiar faces, but there's 150 sure. people in the, in the room and I don't have visibility. It's just as your name pops up, I'm just like another another old friend from the from the no fluff tour. Yep. And so. Java's, uh, Java's getting uh, some, of those, uh, some of those monads. Uh, and, um, and so let's talk about uh, monads as a pattern. Uh, I'll, use, uh, I'll use Scala for this, uh, but uh, what is a monad? A monad, or I'm gonna describe it my way, it is a design pattern, and I was gonna talk about this uh, towards the end, but it is absolutely one of those patterns that we see in functional programming that we don't see in object-oriented programming. 
Uh, and so let me just try to give like the five minute treatment as to uh, what a monad is, and I'll describe it my way. A monad is an object that has flat map and map, has to follow some laws, and the object has a good and evil side to it. Okay. How's that sound? <laughs> All right, so there's a good and evil aspect uh, to a monad. Uh, it has a flat map and map combination to it. Uh, and let's see, what else did I, I say about this? I think, uh, oh yeah, and it has, it has a, a varying set of laws that it has to abide by uh, in order for that monad uh, to work. So <clears throat> um, let me ask uh, uh, Mr. Carducci this, Michael, if I were to say there's a good and evil refrigerator, uh, what in your mind would be a good, uh, a good refrigerator? Are we talking lawful good, chaotic good? Um, Just good, yeah, it's, it's good to have this kind of refrigerator. What characteristic of a refrigerator in your mind would be good and what would be an evil refrigerator? Uh, I, I mean, I would consider a good refrigerator one that keeps my food cool, but, partic but specifically in that like 40 to 45 degree range. Okay, Fahrenheit. excellent. But I, think, but I think one of the, uh, one of the characteristics that you talked about is that it has food. So a refrigerator that has food is good. A refrigerator that doesn't have food is evil. <laughs> so uh, a list is, uh, is a uh, monad. It has flat map. And there's a good list like this. So like, uh, let's do Y, S in here and let's do A, uh, B and C as a list of characters. And so uh, does this have a, a, a flat map to it? Now, both of these are, are good on the good spectrum and they have a flat map associated with it. So let's say for every one of the, yeah, I'm going to use this one for every one of these uh, in the X S's and for every one of these in the Y S's, let's say I'm going to do a map. This is the flat map map combination on each one. And let's say for each one of these, I'm going to uh, turn it into a tuple. And this gives me the ability to do something like this, to do 1A, 1B, 1C, 2A, 2B, 2C, et cetera. And so that's what a flat map is. Now, mm -hmm. what this also does for us though, is that we can do things in a language like Scala uh, is that we can do things like this. So I could write this whole thing uh, like the following. Uh, let's do I uh, X S in here and then J uh, with this arrow Y S and uh, let me yield uh, the same thing. So this is going to be the same as what we see up there. And so we could do things like for comprehensions. So the deeper you go down this particular functional rabbit hole, the more you're gonna be dealing with things like for comprehensions. And behind the scenes, everything is a flat map map using these monads. Now, what's the thing about, or you know, what's the big deal about monads? So let's say I have ZS over here, and that's an empty list. That's an evil list. Uh, so what is that going to look like uh, when I use something like this instead. It will just return that same evil. So in other words, no, ne no necessity for any kind of uh, null pointer exceptions or anything like that. If anything in a chain is evil, then the whole thing's gonna be considered evil. And uh, so we could do that for a wide ar array of things. So I could have, uh, let's say for example, a option uh, one, for example, and uh, let's say option uh, three, for example, from this that I could do again, a flat map for this. And here's, here's the I, and let's bring in B and map uh, with that J. And uh, let's do, uh, let's do I plus, oops, I plus J from this, okay? So it's a chain. And so we could see right here that uh, I have one box or one entity, one collection uh, that has a one inside of it. I have another box that has three inside of it. And so merging everything together, I now have a box with four and that's the combination of flat map and map. And again, I could do the same thing using a four comprehension in some languages uh, like Scala will have something like this. So I could say, hey, let's bring in uh, let's take whatever's inside of this uh, A, 
which is this option and uh, this B. And so what I'll do is I will yield out of this uh, I plus J. And I'll have the same thing come from this. And just like I stated before, that if I have an option uh, empty for that uh, particular type, if there is something evil in this whole chain, then I could just keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. But if there's anything of that evil type, then the whole thing is just going to be considered evil. <laughs> and so we have error handling. This is how we do error handling. We don't have a lot of null checks. Uh, we have options to replace null. And so um, it's a nice design. I really like it a lot. And I would consider that a functional design pattern. So thanks, thanks for that question there. And uh, yes, I would consider, I, I, I too would consider a refrigerator evil if it kept food at, at less than 100K. Under Kelvin. <laughs> Although, I mean, if I was doing like superconducting experiments, that might be uh, a feature. Or if I was trying to figure out some way to to uh, to kind of work the 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 the, the levitation, superconducting levitation into the magic, that that might be something mm -hmm. that we could do as well. But um, well. While we're here, because I th we're, we're we're coming up towards the end, but I, I want to mention one thing mm -hmm. that that this is this is what I miss uh, the most about the, the 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 fact that we're not doing the no fluff tour, that I don't get to to hang out with luminaries such as yourself and and a lot of luminaries on the call, uh, is that is is I am poorer for it. I haven't been. I haven't been learning as much as I have over the last several years, just by virtue of, of teaching, being around you folks, mm -hmm. and by virtue of the conversations that we have in sessions. Like, I don't think, I don't think people appreciate how valuable, uh, as an attendee, how valuable you really are. Um, but, you know, regardless, you know, we've got to keep moving forward. And uh, the one thing that has kept me engaged and kept me growing is the, um, uh, the virtual workshop series and the virtual... Uh, events that we've been doing as well. So literally yesterday, uh, I, I sent, I sent Dano a text and I said, Hey, thanks for dropping the knowledge bombs. And I had, I, took, I sent a picture of my screen. I was going through your full day workshop on Kafka and just trying to, to get current with everything that's happening in that space. Because I, most of my experience with Kafka was in the Hadoop world 10 years ago. And, um, and so think about that for a moment, you know, what what do you want to get better at? What do you want to understand better? Uh, and then I would encourage folks to to wander over to nofluffjuststuff.com and take a look at all of the conferences that are coming up. Yes, they're all virtual, but one of the cool things, if you, if you register for ARCOP, they've got a great deal right now uh, on the team discount. I think the best deal they've ever given. Um, not only do you get the ticket for this year, you get the ticket for next year when hopefully things are back to some semblance of normal uh, for certain values of normal. But, but, we're, but, but right now, our, our intention is to do this live next year. And hopefully, a year from December is enough time, hopefully. But uh, we have the workshops, the virtual workshops virt every single day. In fact, there's one going on right now. And, um, and those are listed on the homepage as well. And, and, uh, and then all of the webinars. All of these have been recorded. We've been doing these every single week. And there's a wealth of information to tap into. But if you are interested, today is the last day to take advantage of this insane flash sale that, that, that the organizers behind No Fluff put together. Uh, I think it's $950. You get access to all to the, the library. So you've got hundreds of uh, half and full day workshops that have been recorded. Uh, we do four a week of the, of the, uh, the, the workshops live with an instructor. And that's access to everything for a year. And it's obviously you can't go to every single one of these, but you can share that with your team. So it's, it's a seat and, and you've got, you've got a season ticket, whether it's you showing up every day or you want to give that season ticket to somebody else. And in that 950, that also gets you a ticket to the third virtual no fluff, just stuff tour stop. So uh, basically for the, for the, for the price to attend the conference, you've got, you've got a, a, year plus of, of high quality education with engaging presenters who are knowledgeable, who keep you engaged and, uh, and, and, and all of this. So definitely check that out. No fluff, just stuff.com.
but um, I think at this point, just kind of open it up to any other questions that we have from folks. Yeah. And by the way, while uh, questions are coming up, uh, let me just state that uh, the thing that I showed you about monads and uh, there's something else called type classes and uh, thanks for that excellent uh, question on the differences of uh, functional patterns versus maybe OOP patterns. Uh, there are a lot of different type class libraries that are coming out for your language. I do Scala, so we've, uh, uh, Scala has always had this for a while. Uh, but if you're doing Kotlin, take a look at something like uh, arrow.kt uh, for that. But uh, JavaScript is getting them, Ruby is getting them. So there's, uh, there's a lot out there. So I just wanted uh, to include that there. But uh, yeah, Carl, you had a question? Maybe. Maybe. Well, Carl went off mute, but I don't know if that was just to heckle uh, or yep. if, if Carl had a question. Okay. All right. Well, it's a little quiet, so I think uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, Dan, or do you have any closing thoughts that, uh, that you want to share? Oh, yeah. Let me, uh, let me just bring up uh, this, uh, this uh, last slide then uh, over here then. And it uh, looks like we got a question over here. Um, but one of the things, uh, so let me just say, here are some, uh, here are some ideas. So if you are uh, JavaScript, take a look at sanctuary type classes uh, for uh, different design patterns, the functional design patterns. Here's Kotlin and uh, uh, here's Python. So uh, a lot of these terms, type classes, monads are, are coming to a language near you. So that may just affect the way that you design your language. Uh, and so the M word here was the thing that I was gonna show you here. Uh, but just the uh, conclusion here, you know, embrace the new type classes, monads, understand what these constructs are in functional programming, uh, but recognize where they came from. Yes, you have a strategy pattern, but the strategy pattern is just a simple function nowadays. But um, you know, understand where it came from, why we had it, uh, and then uh, it just makes things easier and, and communication easier. And All right. Let's see. We had a question here. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the M word, uh, do you have any 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 book recommendations for folks to learn more about them? Um, I don't. I don't know. That's a that's a good question because I think it's going to depend on on the language uh, that you have. Gosh, that one puts me out. I wish I had like a a pretty good reference on there. Cause Jonathan says, don't, please don't say burrito. There was kind of like a, a terrible tale where someone was trying to describe a monad as a burrito and it just like ruined it. <laughs> I, <laughs> like, I what is that. it? That was, yeah. That yeah. Right someone called hand, it so this. Yeah. Someone called it a burrito and uh, an elephant and a few other things. And, and it just made things more confusing. Uh, to me, it's just, you have, you have an object, you have something in it. Uh, and you have flat map and map <laughs> and a few laws uh, to tie in and a good and evil side to it. Uh, Ibrahim has enterprise integration patterns as well, a really good one uh, for more of the enterprise style uh, patterns, value objects, et cetera. So yeah, we, uh, you know, you could extend these patterns elsewhere. Ooh, awesome. And thank you, Adi, for the, uh, for the, for the thumbs up. I'm glad you enjoy our style. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and oh, yeah, Raju has one uh, for Mostly Adequate Guide. Thank you. I didn't answer the question. I think with all the politics going on and politicians not answering questions, I guess that rubbed off on me. <laughs> 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 I was avoiding the question. <laughs> I can't recommend any kind of book, but uh, yeah, Raju uh, came up with one. Again, I think, yeah, it depends on what language you're looking at. Uh, if it's not a language you're familiar with, no Monad tutorial is going to help you out. Uh, I know, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, no Monad uh, tutorials is going to help you if the language that you're looking at is unfamiliar to you. Uh, so I think, again, it also depends on what it is you're looking at. And thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for the help there, uh, Raju. And then Bruce mentioned something, uh, something valuable as well. He says, I find that so many of the functional design patterns that are starting to appear in OO languages came from Haskell. And Haskell mm -hmm. is a great language to learn functional programming. Agree, agree, very much agree. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's wrap up. We are getting close to the top of the hour. So, uh, yeah, uh, Jonathan D says, I agree with Bruce. Haskell is the closest thing to a pure FP language. So, uh, we got to wrap up. We're getting close to the top of the hour. We are almost out of time. So, uh, I appreciate all the kind words in the chat, and I want to reflect that back to you and thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, there were so many familiar faces. Uh, you know, faces, 
in the in in the feed and and honestly we miss all of you so it has been great to connect even in this largely one-sided conversation <laughs> but uh, we do these every week for the most part so uh uh you know you yeah, yeah you're probably on the list because that's just how it works these days uh but but watch for that take advantage of that flash sale that's an insane deal uh that's that's today only uh, i think but um uh, really great opportunity and look forward to seeing you all at events whether they're virtually or in person or or whatever sometime sometime hopefully soon so yep thank you all and take care and stay safe out there thank you Greg. Right. great job everybody appreciate it. thanks